we have had now the opportunity to hear kind of a detailed presentation about various facets of Linux Gusto uh, from our three terrific speakers today. What I want to do is explore a little bit in a conversational format um, the kind of some of the issues that are often asked by our patients, by other physicians, about the condition. And I'm going to start with Dr. Sheth. You know, one of the things, since this is syndromic, one of the questions that always comes up, when do you put that label? When do you code someone as Lennox Gisto? That's a great question. You know, the way uh, we've presented the information, it's with a very clear-cut triad that occurs somewhere between ages of three and five. Uh, but, Joe, you're bringing up a point that really highlights the issue of recognizing it when it first happens. Because remember what we said, we talked of this as a transition, uh, oftentimes from infantile spasms. And in that transition, it's very difficult to recognize change that may occur. So uh, the first issue I would recommend is actually to think about, could this patient have lennox gastro syndrome? And I think the EEG, if you have the clear-cut EEG tip-off uh, of slow spike and wave, that's very helpful. But remember, the EEG pattern evolves over time. So you may not see it in the early stages in its full form. You may actually see it more in its uh, evolving form, and so to be very aware of that. The second thing is if you hear that a patient is dropping, as was mentioned earlier, drops really can take place from uh, the Doze syndrome. Uh, and if it isn't that, and the patient is a little older, then it becomes very clear that you may be dealing with the farm first or the first emergence of Lennox Gastro syndrome. Dr. Jar, what do you think is the most difficult thing about managing a Lennox Gastro patient? I think the hardest part is trying to address the child as a whole along with the family and addressing all the comorbidities that we talked about. Seizures may be, although they are hard to control, may be actually the easiest part to address in this syndrome, whereas you have the, the whole family that is severely impacted by the diagnosis, the frequent seizures, the behavioral problems, the, the prospect of cognitive deterioration down the line. Then you have the seizures, then you have the child themselves, their care, their what are you going to do with them down the line. Um, addressing all these things becomes, uh, becomes your goal and it is crucial to, uh, to agree with the family that you're going to address all these aspects and set the goals so that you don't set up yourself for failure. Um, you have to tell them initially that, uh, well, uh, although we are going to try our best to achieve good seizure control, we don't want to overly sedate the child, we don't want to overly expose them to adverse effects, and at the same time we want to address their education, their behavior, we want to address your family and how is this impacting your family, and then how do we take this child from, from these years into adulthood. Okay. Dr. Vasquez, you did a, a nice job in presenting uh, the various options, but when it comes to medications to our, uh, to our readers, our viewers, what do you prefer to use in terms of agents for Lennox Gusto and, and perhaps in what order, uh, at least for you personally? So we really live in an exciting time in the treatment of Lennox Gusto syndrome because we have major uh, drugs that are now studied in clinical trials. So rufinamide, clobosome, that's definitely new, the new two additions to the uh, program, topiramide, the lamotrigine. So those are drugs that in the newer generation of drugs that may have less of a burden of side effects and perhaps a better um, sort of way to, to use in polytherapy. I often uh, choose the first drug based on the seizure type. Do they start with the, the infantile spasms? Do they need it um, more uh, drop attack uh, type of medicine? Is it something that we need benzos for because it's more of a rescue? type of uh, strategy. So so my, my favorite is really start with the least likely to have toxicity drug and then combine them. Very often the patients um, have a background the valproic acid uh, and then we use different drugs added to it but it doesn't have to be like that. I think that um, my main concern when the patient is having very frequent seizures is not having to use a medicine that is going to take us a long time like lamotrigine, mm -hmm. but yet that's a great option. 
set yourself at, at a pace where you can titrate slowly and then get to your goal. Lennox Gastaut syndrome is go going to be a very chronic seizure type and you need to, to um, sort of go, make your goals attainable and it doesn't have to happen immediately. Okay, which is good advice. Let me bring up a topic that I hate to bring up and uh, we really didn't kind of cover and I'm going to ask you, uh, Dr. Sheth, to kind of uh, help us on what do you tell patients or their family or their caregivers about death, about sudden unexpected death and epilepsy or for that matter just mortality as it pertains to the Lennox Gastaut patient? Could you maybe make some comments there? Joe, that's a, that's a very important point. In the scheme of things, we are not supposed to die before our children. And uh, in epilepsy, that may not necessarily be true. And I think it sort of is a very hard conversation to have, but we know from numerous studies that have been done in a very rigorous fashion that death, unexplained death in epilepsy does take place. And uh, it is something that should be broached. Uh, there's always a hesitation when you've given the family a very devastating diagnosis, when you're managing seizures that are very difficult to control, to be adding one more burden to this family of telling them about the possibility of death, uh, sudden unexplained death. Uh, they're already terrified of the fact that one day uh, the child's going to have a seizure and uh, going to be in a position that's very compromised and, and, uh, and, and possibly pass away. Uh, we try to encourage families to be the heir under their child's wing, not to put them in a glass bubble. So we've, in that context, it's oftentimes difficult to really focus in on an issue uh, of this sudden unexplained death. But on the other hand, it is very important to point out, particularly when it comes to patients with compliance, with trying medication, to really hone in on this issue that seizures and epilepsy it may be benign most of the time, but on rare occasion, it can be fatal. And uh, I think it helps bring uh, the focus back onto the reason we try to look for uh, seizure control, the reason to try other uh, medications and strategies. A very difficult situation. No, I agree. Well, let me kind of bring even uh, another situation, not to the level of death, but one that really hits caregivers and families. And I'm going to ask Dr. Gerard, how do you counsel uh, our, our f families about the issue of education, uh, what the expectation is for school, and for that matter, just the rank and file behavioral issues. W what do you say uh, about those points? Well, like we talked about, the quality of life is very important in these kids. And um, it is very important to realize that they have the cognitive problems early on at the time of diagnosis. F frequently, they some of them have it even before you diagnose them with Lennox Gastaut syndrome. You have to address it in multiple ways. Uh, one needs to enlist the help of the school. So the parents, you need to educate the families that they can ask the school to test their child so that they're appropriately placed. You also, uh, I think each of these kids should have a baseline neuropsychometric evaluation when they are diagnosed so that you kind of figure out what their capabilities are, what they are able to participate in in school and to place them appropriately, and also to understand that this is a dynamic process. So um, uh, the cognitive decline can be accumulative over time. So they need to be re-evaluated and reassessed at different points in time. Don't think that this is a static process. It's a, it's a, it, it changes and evolves with time. Also, it's very important to educate the school about the seizures themselves because you want the school at your side reporting to you the type, how many seizures the child is having, to be familiar with these little atypical absences, the drop attacks, uh, to be to care um, because the child may not be completely with it at school at, uh, at different points during their treatment, depending on how well they're doing with regards to their seizure control. Um, also, injury prevention in the school environment is very, very important. Um, also, you have to educate the school with regards to the adverse effects of medication so that they can observe them and report them back to you. Then there comes the issue of behavior, which is quite dramatic and can be very problematic. You can have excellent seizure control, but the quality of life could be poor just because behavioral control is still an issue. And I think in these situations, it's very important to make sure that you have uh, your child seeing a psychiatrist and a psychologist so that uh, the 
best person that's familiar with managing behavioral issue issues is addressing them. Um, so no, that, that that's very very helpful. Let me, uh, um, um, Dr. Vasquez. Let me ask you another kind of an, another one of these tough questions, which is you presented a lot of options for choices of therapy, which included things beyond medications. So I guess my question is, what order, perhaps, do you choose to go beyond medication to those options of surgery, stimulation, or diet? Fantastic. So, so the the goal, as you can see, is that medications is not everything. This is a comprehensive approach, and we're very lucky to have other options, so we can perhaps decrease the burden of medication side effects. So I often enlist a family and say, this is my option for diet, this is the option, and some families will say, oh, I would love to do that. I w we can enlist the teachers with the caregivers, everyone involved is going to get educated and will make the diet happen. But other families will say, there's no way, I have three other kids, uh, carbs are all over. I mean, it's, it's really not, not an option. So then th that's when uh, other options become uh, available. I always look at the surgical option as something that I will really, really want to uh, polish and manage before I present because it might be over-promising. And you have to be very, very conscious about not promising something that you can't deliver. And in Lenox gasto resective surgery, it's very uh, small number of patients that we can offer worth looking at and it's, it's very important that you do a comprehensive evaluation so you can study that option. So each one of these other ways to treat epilepsy in the lenox gastro syndrome have a very important role, always trying to look at quality of life. The families really have to be part of these decisions. Okay, which is great advice. Let me get to my final question to the group. As you have a lot of uh, interested uh, individuals, physicians, healthcare professionals, patients, uh, caregivers, we'll be looking to see uh, this particular site, Roundtable about information uh, with regards to Lennox Gisto. So really what I'm going to ask you is to give us kind of your big overarching piece of advice or take home message to those that have been uh, uh, listening through all of the presentations with regards to management and care of these individuals. So, um, Dr. Sheth, I'm going to start with you. What, what kind of uh, pearl advice uh, would you like to leave for the audience? I think the uh, issue is that sometimes this comes up from below your radar screen. So I think when it presents, uh, it's really flying low. And uh, the American Academy of Epilepsy, of uh, Neurology, has a very important piece in patients that come to seizure clinics for month in, month out, for year in, year out, where they actually ask the neurologist to ask the question, is this patient an epilepsy surgery candidate patient? What I would recommend for your patients is that in patients that have a generalized EEG discharge, uh, to ask the question, and it's intractable, to ask the question, could this possibly be lennox gasto syndrome that I'm dealing with? It may not have all the features evolved just yet, but that would be important. And having a diagnosis is very important to the family. It's very important for management. You may not be able to cure it, but at least it, there's a syndrome that gives some perspective as to what to expect longer term. Okay, thank you. Dr. Gerard, your, your thoughts? Well, I think it's very important not to overdiagnose, and just like Dr. Shet said, do not underdiagnose, because it's very important to to be able to get that diagnosis as early as possible. Then uh, another important part of this is to come up with a treatment plan, a treatment plan so that you uh, so that it is clear to the family and to yourself as well what are my treatment goals, so that you can address them one by one and um, be able to f to. Make, make sure that the family is part of, of your treatment plan is, and is on your side. Try to get the school involved, try to get all your other um, healthcare providers involved early on so that you, you, have, you can achieve the best, best uh, outcome. That's very, very helpful, thank you. And Dr. Vasquez, your, your, your final thoughts on, on this. So for physicians uh, trying to treat patients with lenox gastaut syndrome, you have to individualize, individualize based on needs, tolerability, and quality of life. Assemble a team of people that are going to help you. Is the therapist, is the teacher, is the family, and they are all going to make you um, sort of treatment plans and help you along the same recommendations that you gave us. 
I want to have this out, take the opportunity to, to thank our terrific uh, presenters uh, today. I hope to everyone who is reading this, listening to this, viewing this, that you find this helpful. Let us know about it on epilepsy.com. Visit the Facebook page. Uh, visit our community site, our blog. Let us know what you like, what you didn't like, or the questions that you may have. We're ready to answer them. And again, thank you very much for your attention, and thank you for our wonderful presenters for their uh, for fantastic informative presentations today. Thanks. Thank you.